Hey everybody, welcome back. Today I wanted to make a video about the new experimental GPU compute features coming to PCG in 5.5. Uh, this is something that's really exciting to me. I've been waiting uh, a long time for it uh, because the performance in PCG can be kind of uh, poor sometimes due to the fact that all of the processes were being run on the CPU. Uh, and with the introduction of GPU compute, uh, certain types of operations can be sped up dramatically. Uh, one really exciting application would be spawning large numbers of instances. Uh, this is something that could be useful in many cases, for example, in the grass series that I recently did, where we ran into problems because we were forced to do all of those operations on the CPU, which caused uh, pretty poor frame times when those um, chunks were being loaded in our hierarchical generation and made it so that it was too expensive to do a lot of the logic uh, in real time. Uh, in, in offline pre-computations, it made generating, you know, it made the editor experience worse when you're trying to deal with all of those instances being spawned on the, the CPU. So I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate an example of how this compares to GP, GPU compute, and then we'll look at a couple of really basic compute shaders to get a handle on how this works. So right now I've got a CPU computed graph uh, that spawns 1 million instances of this sphere. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, disable it. And I want you to pay attention to the um, frame time as it spikes as this is loaded in. So I'm going to turn it on right now. So you'll see we had a huge frame time spike. It took a while for it to load in after I enabled it. So we'll, we'll do that a couple more times. Off, on. Off, on. So see 150, 160 millisecond frame time spikes as these assets are being loaded in and all of the PCG logic is being ran. So, I mean, obviously this is meant to be kind of overkill, but you can see how uh, loading these on the CPU is not very efficient. Let's try the same thing on the GPU now. On, off, on, off, on. So you'll see that the uh, the same one million spheres when um, when the points are being generated by and the meshes are being spawned purely on the GPU happens instantly. There's no frame time spike whatsoever. Uh, in both cases, of course, the actual performance after the spheres are spawned is worse um, because we have one million spheres on screen. But um, but there's no performance hitching at all uh, as these are brought in all at once. Uh, so that's the power here of GPU compute. And I uh, just want to talk about how this is accomplished. And then we'll look at the, the shaders. So first, uh, we have the static mesh spawner. Uh, this is one of the most expensive nodes in PCG. So having the ability to operate this on the uh, GPU is great. They're going to be adding GPU compute options for more nodes in the future. So I want to keep this pretty high level and hopefully uh, do more in-depth tutorials down the road. But you'll see here that there's a new checkbox to execute on GPU. Simply just checking that box will allow the static mesh spawner to run its logic on the GPU. Uh, and that's alone going to save a lot of time. It does have some limitations. So for example, anything that's loaded on the GPU and not the CPU um, isn't going to be able to be in ray tracing, for example, uh, because it would not be in the BVH. Um, it's also not going to work with uh, a handful of other settings and features inside of the static mesh spawner. So in some instances, you may need to use CPU uh, mesh spawning, but especially for visual effects, uh, things like grass, for example, that don't need collisions and you probably wouldn't want in your ray tracing BVH anyway for other reasons, uh, can be loaded on the GPU. And uh, things that maybe you do want on the CPU, you can load them on the GPU while they're far away and then swap them over to the CPU when um, when you need collisions, for example. So the current workflow allows for you to pass data to and from the GPU and the CPU whenever you need. But in this case, we're just keeping it purely on the GPU. Uh, so the static mesh spawner, biggest cost in this graph. The second largest cost is going to be the surface sampler uh, most likely. And then the transform points is going to be pretty low cost in this case, but 
uh, does have you know some cost being especially when we're calculating so many points and, and changing all of them. So the um, custom HLSL node will allow us to do those things um, without having to um, pay as significant of a cost because we can do it all in parallel on our GPU. So we need to go to HLSL here and we'll see we have custom point processor and point generator. In this case, we're using point generator and the point generator node has a couple of things that we can adjust. So first it has a point count um, and what you set in the point count here will be uh, uh, loaded in here as a constant that can be accessed within uh, the code. And just as a quick side note, to bring this window on the left-hand side up, you go to uh, window and then node source editor and it will give you your HLSL uh, panel here, which is really nice. Uh, so in any case, you can set the number of points. In this case, I've set it to a little over a million. And you can also define input and output pins. So in, for example, in this case, I've got uh, an input pin labeled land and the allowed point type is set to landscape. And you'll notice that when you change this point type, it's actually changing our uh, declarations automatically. So if I change this to texture, you'll see it says input texture data functions. Set it to landscape, we've got input landscape data functions. So they've got pre-built helper functions inside the uh, node editor here uh, that we can reference and it'll you know, show relevant ones to the pins that we have created. So let's go ahead and look at this really basic HLSL compute shader here and talk about how it is achieving the exact same effect as our CPU shader, or excuse me, our CPU computed um, graph is. So there's a couple of things that this uh, compute shader is doing. Um, the first thing it is doing is running a helper function here, uh, which we can find in this section. So here's the helper functions. We've got a float three get component bounds min and get component bounds max. So these are pre-built functions that we can reference uh, or call in our uh, compute shader. So we're doing just that. We're saying float three, and then we're naming this min equals get component bounds min and float three max equals get component bounds max. All right, so this is defining the bounds of our PCG volume in our compute shader. Then we're running this helper function here that says create grid uh, 2D and it is going to uh, need an element index, a number of points, minimum and a maximum uh, value. And so those in our case, we're gonna say float three position because this, the, what this returns is a um, position of each element in this grid. So uh, float three position equals great grid 2D. And then element index we'll find here defined under our uh, per thread contact co um, constants. Point count is of course defined by uh, our input constant. And then min and max are defined by our bounds. Uh, and so what this is going to do is it's going to create a grid. If we just go ahead and get rid of some of this other stuff, what we'll find is that uh, it's creating a grid that is flat. And so in this case, we can see that that is all underground, right? Um, so we want to bring this grid up to our um, terrain and have it sample the terrain. So because we have created our input pin here that samples the landscape, we can use our input landscape data functions. So we are going to uh, grab this one first, which is float land, and it'll automatically change these helper functions based off of the pin. So uh, that's this is land because the pin name is land, land underscore get height, and then it wants a uh, float three world position. So we are going to say float height equals land get height. And the position we're going to sample is the position on the grid that we defined previously. Then we're going to set the Z component. So position dot Z of our position to equal the landscape's height. So now the sampled height of our landscape can be used to define the um, Z position of our, um, of our point. Next, we need to actually pass this data out to our static mesh spawner. So there's a bunch of uh, output data functions that are generated for or created for us here. So we, we see we have an output set position. 
Um, and there's a bunch of other things as well that we can use. Um, so for now, we'll just use output set position and out, uh, out set scale. So we've got out underscore set position, and then uh, it wants a data index. And the data index we're going to use again is going to be our per thread constant of uh, out underscore data index. Uh, then element index will simply just be element index. And then the position uh, that it wants it here will be the position that we defined our, you know, our x, y from our grid and our z from our terrain. Then for out set scale, uh, we are going to do the same, except in this case, I'm just going to hard code a scale of um, 0 0.05, uh, 0 0.05 rather. So that way it just perfectly matches the transformations that I was doing in the transform points. So as you can see, really basic compute shader. We're just getting our bounds. We're creating a grid. We're setting our vertical height and we're passing that data out. Um, and then it's retrieved by our static mesh spawner. So uh, this is, I think, a really good starting point. Uh, and then from here, you can adjust this code based off of whatever your uh, actual need is. Now, I can imagine that most people probably don't want a perfect ordered grid of spheres and need something a little more uh, practical. So for the final example, I wanted to show a field of hot dogs. So uh, here I have one million hot dogs uh, swaying in the wind and uh, what this is doing that is different than the previous node uh, set up is that we are randomly jittering our position. So instead of having an ordered grid, we've got some randomization to our position. And um, it's also aligned to the normal of the landscape rather than um, just uh, being spawned in the meshes default orientation. That might be kind of hard to see here. Uh, this actually from this angle, you probably can't tell. So you can see that they are tilted slightly to the left here and then tilted slightly to the right here. So they're rotated to align with the landscape's normal. Uh, so there's a couple of changes in this here uh, that we'll talk about. First, I did also want to mention there's a third tab, shader functions. This allows you to create your own functions that you can call in your shader if you wanted to. Um, I'm not using that for this example, but good to know. Uh, so what's different about this? Uh, well, first we are creating a per instance random value for our jitter. So if we go to our helper functions, we can find that we have a um, float here. It says uh, frand in out int uh, uint seed. So this returns a random float between zero and one. Um, and then how do we get our seed? Well, there's a couple of ways you could do that. Um, the way that I'm using here is computing the seed from the position. So we're saying um, uint seed equals compute seed from position. And the position that we're going to use is the position that um, was originally spawned from, okay? And then we are going to say uh, float random equals frand seed. So now we have a random value computed from the seed that was computed from the position. Then we are going to create a, uh, in this case, a vector. Um, so float three V equals zero, zero, zero. And then I am turning that vector into a, um, a direction basically to offset from the spawned position of the hot dog. So in this case, v dot x equals cosine of random and v dot y equals sine of random. So that'll give us a direction on the unit circle uh, that we can offset our uh, hot dog by. So then we're going to say that position equals position plus uh, v times, in this case, 20. So I just hard coded saying offset the uh, hot dog by 20 units from uh, its original point in the direction of the um, the vector that was created from our random seed. So all of this just offsets, creates a random value and then offsets along that, um, that position. Um, then just like before, we are uh, setting our Z to our terrain height, although I'm adding a slight modifier. So saying uh, height minus two in this case to just make it so that um, the hot dog is slightly embedded in the ground, as you can see. 
uh, rather than um, right resting on top of it. And then we are uh, also uh, getting the normal vector of our landscape. So you'll see if we look at our uh, landscape helper, helper uh, functions uh, or data functions, we had get height, but we also had get normal. So float three land underscore get normal, uh, and it is expecting a uh, world position. So at this point in time, now that we have our offset position, we're going to find the uh, normal of that position. So we're going to say uh, float three normal equals land underscore get normal of position. Remember, we've already offset our position, so it's returning the right one. Uh, and then this is all just experimental stuff. I'll get rid of that. Uh, then we're defining a rotation value uh, because the rotation function uh, here, so set rotation expects a float four, but our normal is a float three. So I'm just defining um, rotation uh, and we're saying rotation dot X, Y, Z uh, plus uh, normal X, Y, Z. And so basically this is just giving us um, you know, normal X, Y, Z, and then zero as a uh, float four named rotation. And then in our out underscore set rotation, out uh, underscore data index, element index, and then rotation. So this is basically rotating the um, the, tran the point to align to the normal based off of what we have sampled from the landscape. Uh, and that's pretty much all there is to that. So you can see, uh, you know, a much more practical example here of um, using this point data. You know, you'll probably want to uh, align your points to the landscape as you would with the surface sampler or, you know, randomly apply uh, rotations and things like that. All of that is definitely possible here. And um, yeah, I think that's all for now. I do hope to be able to talk more about this in the future as this feature expands, but hopefully this gets you started in the right direction and thanks for watching.